some depressive symptoms, there are some post-traumatic things going on, and it's real. Um, you try to not re-experience the trauma because you're like, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm closing my study. I'll see this thing of giving myself a break. Three months. Of I'm not coming back in here. But then, in that, you also um, cut yourself off your momentum of the plan that you had as well. So there's this period of confusion where you're feeling sad, as if you're traumatized, as if you're hit by something, as if somebody died, but you can't explain it because it's not a human being. It's not even your dog that died. So, the, you know, so, but the feelings are the same. Um, and we maybe try to numb ourselves um, because maybe you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to try living again. Let me try a new thing. And that new thing, you're into it, you're into it, but then it doesn't last because actually it's a form of medication. So whether you're going to start a new hobby or you're going to start drinking because let's celebrate, then the drinking becomes now actually an addiction or um, you, you, you begin to shop because when last did you buy yourself a dress um, and it becomes this habit of filling yourself because you, there is this gap physically in terms of time, physically in terms of what you're doing uh, uh, activity wise, but also emotionally because there's not this drive emotionally that you have to get to a target. So there's an emotional gap as well. Um, and so this thing is <coughs> um, so in the grief, there's some feelings of loss. Um, you don't have to call your supervisor anymore. So the Saturday, usual 9 a.m. Zoom meeting that lasts until 11 o'clock is not there anymore. So you, there are also connections, literally connections that are lost. Um, feelings of um, a meaninglessness because there's this drastic change. Um, things are not as they used to be. Um, you might feel disorientated. You might feel stuck. What's next? And where is the adrenaline? Because the whole thing of getting feedback from your supervisor, so submitting another copy, getting feedback, it's keeping, physiologically speaking, your, 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 your um, body is pumping adrenaline, physiologically speaking, as, as a fact. So when there is nothing to look forward to, the adrenaline is not pumping. Um, the same circuit of this adrenaline is the same circuit that goes on when somebody is addicted to drugs. And that's how people get addicted to drugs. Because the, the, in the adrenaline, you look for your next fix, then you go and get the drug, and then you get the fix and an end. And this time, your supervisor is not there to give you a next fix or feedback. So the adrenaline is not there anymore. And you may try to replace um, the fix by getting a new hobby. So how do we work with post PSD syndrome? Um, so people end up talking to me um, at the point of having experienced all the things that I've spoken to until now. So they've done, the, they've walked on the stage, they've done the parties, they felt the depression, they felt the grief, they felt the post-traumatic symptoms. Um, and at that point, um, when they really hit the slump and they're frustrated with themselves, that's probably when they get to chat to me. And so the conversation that I end up having with them is about the entry. Um, when you are um, focused on finishing and an end, you hardly have sex with your partner, your husband, your wife. You hardly pay attention to your children. You hardly go with your friends. You hardly going shopping. You hardly doing your exercise. You are focused on talking to your supervisor. You are focused on meeting the requirements for defense and whatever. You are focused on um, studying your study for days. This thing has to do with the connections. Your husband, your children, your friends, yourself. These ones that you're not doing. Then you get your PSD.
PhD, your supervisor is not there anymore. You don't need to study anymore. You don't need feedback anymore. So you lose these connections or this purpose. But while you were pushing this, you lost out on this. Your relationship with your husband, your wife, your children, your <coughs> friends, yourself, your therapy, shop, your shopping therapy, your massages, your whatever, however you take care of yourself. And now you find yourself in the middle of having nowhere to go. Because there's no PhD things to do and there's no other lifestyle things to do. And so the issue is about re-entry into your marriage, into your relationships, into your social circle, into getting back into your exercise routine. There's re-entry that happens. But we cannot deny that this re-entry comes with difficulty. Because you are weird, remember? You are weird. And now that you have acquired this PhD, you, it has been certified that you are weird. It is now for sure that you are weird. You are 1% of the population who is crazy. You have become a statistic. Mm. Right? And the PhD does not only happen on paper. And this is the thing that we don't realize. The PhD happens also psychologically <coughs> and in your emotions. As a person, you change. There are things that you could tolerate before you had a PhD. And now actually you have no time for it. And one of the reasons why is because you have had time outside of it. You have had time outside relationship with your husband so closely or outside time with your friend who's abusive, who likes to freeload on you, you have the time out. So now, to go back in, you're like, no, that's not for me. And so, you have changed. <laughs> and the PhD forces you into a metamorphosis. And you are now a different person. And this is probably the reason for sudden divorces, which I hear about a lot, um, sudden moves, like I had a sudden move to this day, nobody saw it coming. Um, I didn't see it coming either. <laughs> um, so, so, so these, because you change and you have no time for nonsense anymore. Um, because you had had time outside of the nonsense that you were putting up with um, in your last year or last six months. And this thing has given you time to, in the background, process the nonsense that you wouldn't tolerate on, an, on a normal uh, situation. Um, and so when you re-enter, you, it's a new relationship, by the way, when you re-enter. Even if you were married for 10 years, you do a PhD, and then 15 years later, if you're married, you are done. It's, it becomes a new relationship because you're a new person. And so you are having to renegotiate the space, renegotiate who you are in those relationships, in those spaces, renegotiate how you're going to partake in those spaces, how you want others to relate with you. And this is where the conflict comes in. And it's like this PhD has ruined my life. So... Why I think it's important for you to bring this here is because I would like you to be aware. Because when you're aware, then you can also prepare for it. And you can begin to do this re-entry slowly but surely towards the end. That it's not the sudden thing that you now need to do in, out of panic. Because when huh? you do out of panic, most of the time it doesn't necessarily work. Um, so, if it's possible, if it's necessary, not possible, if it's necessary for you, and you see that three months later after your PhD, the slump is not coming off, um, it's time for you to go to therapy. Because it means that you need help. Um, so people stay too long in the slump, and then they lose their jobs, um, and, and they cannot carry on. 
Yeah, no, thank you very much. What are some of the strategies people should could employ to to manage this transition? Okay, I think with any adjustment, um, it is really about first being aware that, and this is why I wanted to bring this here. So the first step is awareness. Because if you're aware, then you can anticipate some of these challenges, right? You know where you have disconnected. Um, whether it's your gym plan or your relationship with your husband, there's this that issue that you left five years ago that you didn't discuss. Um, and when you come back, it's still going to be an issue. You know about that issue, right? So things like that. So you know where you have disconnected. Um, you, you know which relationships are suffering which ones are not going to work after PhD, mm. because there are some relationships that are not going to work after PhD. Sure. Make peace with it. Make peace with it. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the favorite line is, you think you're better. And, and, and my response is, yes, I am. Because I'm 1%, bro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, make peace that you are better. Um, but I think the other thing that kills us is that I am better in in the area of my topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have been in psychology, but I don't have a PhD in 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 every single psychology that you can think of. So I still have areas of learning to, to do, and even in the field of. My, in the area of my study, I pick a little portion out of that area of my study. So I'm not, I don't even have a PhD in the whole area of student leadership. I, 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 I can tell you about dynamics when we study uh, student leadership using social link drawing. That's, that's what I can tell you. Mm. So it's also our attitude in terms of how we relate to the other people about this big head that we get. Mm. The big head that we get also makes it difficult for us <clears throat> to get re-entry. No. Um, so, one thing that I know is that when you want to know how a person is, put them under pressure. Mm. If you want to know this is an orange juice, squash, you can use, you smell it. It makes orange juice um, so this, the pressure of being the 1% also exposes who we are. So if you were always arrogant, you will be extra arrogant, so you will struggle with re-entry. Right? So I'm saying to you, be ready for a self-discovery. Because what happens when you finish your PhD is that you, you now actually get to know who you are mm. um, because of that slum because when you're sitting on that couch and you have nothing to do the only thing you can think of is reflect it, do introspection all of that stuff it's natural um, and you may end up in a more of a blues triggered by the post PhD but actually because of issues that have always been there but you were not attending to them because you didn't have the time, you didn't have the capacity, I mean, also intellectually speaking, because what the PhD does, it gives you some kind of higher level of, of, of abstraction to be able to function. So you have an argument with someone, and they will not hear you because you speak here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why relationships also struggle to work. Yeah. The PhD has pulled you up cognitively so. Um, so, it's ready to be aware um, and to be ready for the self-discovery, to accept that the self-discovery will happen, and then to make peace with who you are on the other side. Mm. Because then you want to cross over this river. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Professor Shai and I know people who went into PhD and got so committed to PhD, they come out in two forms. One is those who never want to leave PhD after PhD. Yeah. 
They want to keep all the friends on that. They want to work like that, PhD. They can't go about it. In other words, they want to not exit and re-enter new lives and stuff like that. They go completely, and those are the ones who close themselves up in the offices. They're very antisocial to their own colleagues. If they're academics, they just want to do that. They talk to themselves when they walk. They just become the strange figure. The other ones are those who completely lose interest in study. And they end up with PhDs that never get followed by anything because the PhD killed everything. They are completely irredeemable from those. How, what do you say about those? Probably you remind me, I actually did want to speak about it. the different points where you hit post-PhD syndrome. Um, so, the, the, in my observation, um, and probably logically speaking, PhD syndrome will hit you the worst at the end. Mm-hmm. But my theory is you get your PhD in stages. You get your PhD when you finish your proposal. I mean, if I talk about big milestones, I feel like every time you finish something, you get your PhD. Mm. Mm. Okay, but let me talk about the sort of big, big points. So when you finish a proposal and, and you go to research com and they like it, you, you know, there's a level of accomplishment there. Um, when you get ethics clearance, you collect your data, you analyze, you start writing up, you get your final draft. So all so PhD can a PhD syndrome can hit you also at those points. Mm. Um, where you you analyze your data, you feel so accomplished, it's all in your head. You cannot type it. It's in your head. You're stuck. It's a characteristic of his post-PhD syndrome. Mm. Um, because you, 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 the sense of accomplishment, um, it hits you like a, like a traumatic signal. Um, and to come out of it will, will be something that looks like what do you do when you have finished and completed. So, the low level, the low levels of productivity, um, is characteristic of um, this post PhD syndrome, mm. um, and that's why some people either cannot finish because they cannot get out of this depressive mode um, when they have accomplished that they collected data, they analyzed it, now they need to write it. But it can also be a psychological block because of fear of I don't know who I'll be. On the other side, so I'd rather just not finish so I can maintain this identity. Yeah. Because the reality is you are getting a new identity. It's a reality. And some people are scared of their new self. <laughs> and this, you know, as if you are getting a new jacket, you know, you must take out the student jacket and put on the qualified person jacket. That, you know, so... So sometimes it's fear of the change of who I'll be, the re- and the, the anticipation of you know fear is a very interesting thing. It can predict for you what will happen. So people might unconsciously know that if I finish this thing, my friends will reject me, my husband won't like me anymore, I won't know what to do with my friends. So they maintain their lifestyle the way they know it. Um, and that, those are usually OCD people um, and people who are obsessed with control. Um, they want to keep their lives the way they know it so that it doesn't have to change so that they don't have to deal with the consequences. Mm. Um, and then the, maybe the third kind of people that you're talking about um, are those with um, serious, serious depressive symptoms. Um, because in depression, one of the markers um, is loss of interest and feeling apathy. So they may be so deep in that depression that... Um, and because they, there is no language today to verbalize that I'm having post PhD syndrome, they don't know how to say what is wrong with them. Mm. So they don't know how to get help. Mm. Um, so I think this is an important, an important issue about doing PhD that we need to talk about more. Mm. Um, because we focus on how do you start and how do you finish. But we, we, we never really talk about what happens after. How to exit. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so the transition 
Mm. Um, it is characteristic of any transition for someone to hit the slump. It is characteristic. Any transition is like that. You must hit a depression. Um, because it is in that depression where you reflect and you think about, okay, fine, I'm down here. How, must, how can I go up? Um, and so let yourself get into the depression. Let it happen. Um, but now you are letting it happen knowing exactly what it is, how to look for it, how to identify it. And then the strategies to come out of it have to do with, okay, fine, I have to re-enter. And where is, where, are, where is it that things are broken down? Um, where is it that um, I'm disconnected? So that I can plug in. Mm. So those are the points to look for. A few comments and questions around the floor. We have about five minutes and have that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for, for the interesting talk. Um, but I couldn't help, as, as you were talking, that you think, actually at this stage, I'm at, I'm at the point where I would love that post-PhD syndrome. Right? <laughs> Anything post-PhD is fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, so 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 I, I, I get that, but the, the overwhelming anxiety that we have right now is just finishing. <laughs> and, and so we can't even fathom, okay, I can't, I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone else. I, yeah. <laughs> I can't even fathom uh, the, the type of grief that you spoke about, for example, that, that comes after this. I'm thinking, no, I'm going to turn up after this, you know, I'm going to do all of these things. Of course. Right? So, so, so I, I, can, I can already see how, how that is a potential pitfall, right? That, that you think that there's this nirvana after the PhD. <laughs> so, so, so perhaps can, can you speak to that, that, that maybe it's how the PhD has been sold to us, that once, once we have it, uh, it, it will, yes, open all these doors or whatever it may be. Maybe that's what is also the, the, the major cause of a kind of post-PhD syndrome as, as you are uh, articulating. Because as, I, as, as, as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm thinking, but how, how could any of this be? Because uh, that's, that's the last thing that can, I can ever imagine yeah. a PhD would bring to my life. You know, it would, it's supposed to bring the exact opposite. Um, so so, I, so I'm, I'm saying, I, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, I don't understand. <laughs> Uh, my grief is happening now. What is your grief about now? To finish. Right? Yeah. You know, just need to, to get this done. Right? It's, 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 it's this overwhelming project that's hanging over my head. And, and, and that's it's, it's kind of what the, the processes and steps that I need to go through, even psychologically, just to get through this thing. Um, yeah, to the point that I, I can't imagine that post this 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 process that I'm in, it's going to be worse than what I'm doing now. <laughs> yeah. So, so I don't understand what you mean by you have a grief now, but you're probably talking about anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Pressure. Semantics. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more anxiety because yeah. grief is about loss. The loss of lives. And the yeah. Nostalgia of sorts. Yeah. Unless if you have already preempted the end, because what can also happen is that you can sit with your your current reality, your present reality on one level, and subconsciously below this awareness of your current reality, you're already starting to preempt what will happen afterwards. Sometimes we know what sometimes we know what we don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um so so maybe maybe it's that if you talk about it as grief, but I can imagine um that you're probably relating to the balloons. You know, like when I'm finished it's going to be a party. Yeah. And FMB is going to call me for a black card just because I have a doctor in front of my name. And Standard Bank is going to give me one million rand extra to get a bond. And it's it's, ah. it's these things, right? Yeah. And, and I will then, arrive. It's a reality mm. that you will arrive. Mm. Because suddenly your HOD will call you and say, we need to now make sure that you get a promotion in six months' time. Sure. So... There are these targets. 
this is hype around finishing. And there's supposed to be a hype around finishing because you are one or one percent. Yeah. So of course there is a hype. Yeah. Um and and so you and this is why you hate the slum. Because your anticipation was for the hype. But the hype ends with the party, you <laughs> go and sign for the new car, you get your promotion, the honeymoon ends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then reality strikes. Yo. There are no people around. You don't know how to speak to your partner anymore because you haven't done it in a long time. You look at them in their eyes and it's like, who are you now? And and your children, when you started PhD, they were three. When you end PhD, they are eight. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah. Um and 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 you I I agree with you and I understand what you're saying when you say you cannot fathom it because right now what is in front of you is the celebration stage. Yeah. And I'm talking to you about at the end of the celebration yeah. when we turn off the lights and close the doors. Yeah. And now you are left alone with your reality by yourself. Because remember, you used to spend a lot of time by yourself in your study. Even when you're sitting here, you're by yourself. You are with people, but you are concentrated on your computer. You're by yourself. So your best friend is this laptop. Um, and so when there is no PhD anymore, and you need to re-enter the rest of life, it's as if you lost the skills to do that, or you're a stranger to everyone else and everywhere else. Yeah. So you, of course you cannot fathom that. Yeah. And it's traumatic to you, for me to even bring it here and be like, this is your reality. Mm. But I, I, I would like to save you from staying in it. And one of the ways to stay out of it is to be able to anticipate it, prepare yourself for it, and know how to deal with it. Mm. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges is that when you get, to, when you get your PhD, uh, after the celebration, a month later, people feel, feel we have underperformed. Yeah. Because you've already got a PhD for a month earlier, but you don't see evidence of it. Yeah. You haven't published a book, you haven't put a month later. Yes. They already think. And everybody of your colleague also have higher expectations of you. Yeah. Uh, if you operate at normal level, it looks like we're underperforming. Yeah. There's a sense that there is even greater pressure than after. And there will be those who are seen now who will tell you, our page is only just a paper. It's only beginning now. Yeah. So they puncture your, your energy. You haven't told you are 1%. Now we start to feel that you are like the bottom percent <laughs> very soon. Yeah. Yes. And, and then thing. Okay, I have two quick questions. One question is, I was wondering, I'm wondering if you shouldn't then have an a different kind of workshop at the beginning of the page to avoid this <laughs> One way we actually balance our life a little bit more. I mean, I don't quite relate to this thing of like, I, I think I, I was getting to the other side almost to a fault of, I refuse to let the PhD have my life. So yeah. that I just gave the PhD nothing and here I am. Um, but maybe we should have a different conversation. We need a different conversation at the beginning of the PhD about how to balance so that the transition to post PhD is better. Sure. True. But also, the second thing is you spoke about now finding comfort in alcohol and stuff after the PhD because you. But what if you found the comfort during the PhD, you know, and you become a little bit of a para during the PhD because <laughs> you need some things to keep you going to get them? How do you then transition out of that to actually be like, this is not to find healthier? coping mechanisms for the PhD to avoid, I don't know, being addicted to other things like drugs, sex, pornography, all sorts of weird things that people get addicted to. Because some of the addictions actually happen during the PhD and not after the PhD. And after the PhD, it's struggling to get out of these unhealthy things you had gotten accustomed to during the PhD. Okay, Thank you. Yeah. I think I want to return to his question. Instead of responding to what you asked, you spoke about, you emphasized what you were talking about, you clarified what you were talking about, which is the course part. 
and I think it's related to what Zianda is talking about to say, how do we survive the journey now if you have any of that? To say, um, the anxiety that we wake up with every day, sometimes you can't even leave the house, uh, you can't even sleep, and all of that. So how do we pull through? How do we get to what he was asking to say, right now, whatever the post, I don't care. I will get there when I, I will see when I get there. But how do we progress from where we are at now? And then I guess what we're talking about is to do with um, I'm going to be submitting the thesis, but the lifestyle remains. I'm not mm. submitting it. <laughs> um, so, but how do we get there? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll say what I said in a different way. Okay. Um, the question about um, only, okay, let me tell you what I'm thinking. What I'm thinking is we cannot avoid this post based syndrome. So I can come and tell you about it. Somebody else can come and tell you about it. And you can read a lot about it. We cannot avoid it. It will happen. So the, I think that's the point that I was trying to make. That be aware, it will happen. It, it, it can hit you little bit, or it can hit you a lot. And we can never predict that. And so the, the, the purpose of information is not so much to control that it doesn't happen, because we cannot avoid it. It will happen. It's winter, you're getting cold, you will get a flu. It will happen. It's like that. You may have small flu that you cure in two days, or you can have that one that lasts for a month. But at the end of the day, it's winter, you're getting flu. Right? So mm. it is characteristic of after PhD that you will be in a slum. You cannot avoid it. Okay. Mm. Now, what I'm trying to do here is to help you to be more conscious about what is happening with you. Because I find that a lot of times people don't know what is happening to them and with them. And it is this whole confusion about what is going on. And after we chat, then I'm like, no, it's actually just post blues. You get it with postnatal depression. You get it with on the anniversary of somebody very close to you uh, dying. Um, you, you remember them and you feel sad again. And it's, it's natural. Um, so I started calling it post PhD syndrome as a joke because I was relating it to the other thing that happened to us, like post natal depression and, uh, um, you know, the, the bereavement cycles and things like that. So, um, so we cannot avoid it. it. It will happen. How you can make it more manageable, of course, it is about how are you prepared for it during the PhD um, and also how you are approaching the PhD during your last stage. Um, so the anxiety that you're talking about and the adrenaline that's pumping, um, the more adrenaline you have, for me, the greater the chance that you will hit the slump quite high. Um, because physiologically speaking, if you are making adrenaline, if, if your PhD is a trigger for adrenaline, a lot of it, when you don't have the trigger, it means you have no adrenaline, a lot of it anymore. So physiologically speaking, you, you, your body will be physiologically depressed because it doesn't have that adrenaline that keeps it going. So that's also another reason why. You, you cannot do without it because the adrenaline is not there, because the trigger is not there. Um, so my talk today was about what happens after, um, and we've had other talks about what do you do during, how do you manage your thoughts, how do you do emotional intelligence, how do you take care of yourself. We've, we've had those talks and maybe Prof must do it again. Um, and I mean, what I was talking to Prof about was, how about we publish a kind of like psychological manual, um, you know, and, and, and in, in that booklet, we talk about the different stages and what happens in the different stages and how to deal with the different stages. Um, so, 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 yeah, I'm thinking about doing something like that for, for Prof's group. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank so, you. I hope I answered your question. Yes. Now. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, I know. I mean, uh, uh, Professor Chirizi Marwala, who is the VC of UJ, we went to university together in the same PhD group. It was in engineering, of course. But how he coped with it is that in the second day of his PhD, he was, he was authoring those reflections about how PhD was. And was like talking about it as if it was past tense. And he would write those things and start this. And then he started to organize parties for us. And he started to kind of act like he's no longer in PhD. He would set the segments for himself to kind of normalize himself. I know that how I did it is that I became active physically in the second year as well, at PhD. Uh, I, did it, I did forum dance, I did Latin American dance, I would run, and I continued, that took me beyond the PhD. Because for me, P the PhD had this adrenaline element. It would power me up, it would all at work and stuff like that. So I needed to deal with it physically, and he needed to deal with it through writing and narratives and stuff like that. Though he's in engineering, he started to write social science issues. He started to explore new areas and stuff like that. And he started to apply for postdocs at a second year. And then they would, they would shortlist him and then they would find out he doesn't have a PhD yet. Then he'd ask them to shift it to the following year. So he was all intents and purposes coming out of it. I don't know how you coped with it, uh, uh, Professor Shai. What, what did you do to prepare yourself or what did you do to, to cope? Um, with it because it's a it's a huge challenge, yeah? Professor. Uh, prof, I, I really, I think I never had a problem because what happened is I was fortunate that upon completion of my honors degree, yeah. I landed an intern opportunity at the Africa Institute of South Africa. So you're a research I intern, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. the culture of research. Mm -hmm. So I actually started publishing even before I enrolled for the master's. Mm -hmm. So that's why even upon the completion of the PhD, yes. I still knew that I have got the moral and humanitarian obligation as an academic to continue to enhance the existing body of knowledge. So, but in the end, after PhD, you were also going to go academia. So you were yes. prepared along the route. Yes. But had you gone into government, it might have hit you. Exactly. Because you'd have changed with a, a change. If you'd gone into business, into research, another area of work, there would not have been a continuity. It's true. And we've seen it in academia with people who could, did not need to go that way. Because the, once they got a PhD, they became dead academics. They have PhD, but they, are, they, they cannot show anything for a PhD. And we often blame them. We don't quite realize it might be a post-PhD syndrome. They never recovered from it. The universities put programs to assist them. They never get that first article out for 10 years. And those are the toughest people in, in proposal committees. They're very tough about people's proposals. It's not, no rigor. <laughs> they have to deal with post PhD phenomena 10 years later. Yes, sis. then we shouldn't see it like that. We should see it as I have many other goals. For instance, there's a lot of things that still will happen after the PhD. For instance, if you're aiming to get married, get married, getting married is not the it, but there's a journey of marriage as well. You know, so those are, that's how I think that's how we should see this journey, that we shouldn't be defined by the fact that I'm going to be red, wearing a red gown, mm -hmm. but be defined by the fact that, okay, once I've worn the red gown, Oh, there are many more other journeys that I'll have to go on. Yeah. Other than uh, uh, the one that is on the track of at the moment, yeah, of the PhD, yeah. because sometimes we we cannot re-enter because now we keep ourselves on. After the red gown, I must do my rating, and then I must become a professor. So you never re you never diversify. <laughs> you are on this track, um, and 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 you are always an academic. You can't do anything else. 
you can't hold a conversation about Tisanyama. Like, yes. We are all talking about John Cena. You don't know who's that. And, you know, and it's so, 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 there's also that thing. Sure. Of, of, of keeping a wide mind about who you are. Yeah. Um, and some things will fall away post PhD syndrome. Sure. Post PhD. Yeah. They will fall away because, like I said, you are you you change. Your personality will become more re, more defined, more solidified because there are some things that you will not have time for. That I can promise you. Yeah. Um. And and but so you become a new person. It's like you go through a metamorphosis. Sure. But in that metamorphosis, I'm encouraging mm-hmm. you to keep a wide mind about. Yeah where you are involved sure um so that you can re-enter so don't we we, we should not um or we rather not wait for re-entry at the point of panic where you hit a slum and now where do i go and now you're looking for where to find <laughs> comfort yeah um it makes sense to anticipate it and to so when you're planning your party your phd party also plan for the rest of your life after it, mm. which means reconnecting mm. with your friends, making more time, yeah. reconnecting with your children, getting into your self-care routine, that whole thing, yeah. so that you can help yourself come out on the other side with those connections that you need. Yeah. But sorry to disturb you. I have a problem with the word reconnecting after. Yeah. Why can't we also live and connect whilst doing the PhD? So it's like now we are leaving everything for later. That's the problem. We are making the PhD define us. Because now it stops everything. I'm not saying that, okay, obviously, I have cheat days. I have ice cream days. And within the year, sometimes I feel guilty and I have to work more to compensate. But sure. we, why can't it all exist together? Like Zeanda was saying. Yeah. 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 Post-PhD syndrome, yeah. and we actually just live in it. Doesn't become this thing that defines us for just three years. Okay. Yeah. Let me let, let, let me tell you why you, why what you're saying is not completely possible. Okay. Because at the end of it, in your last six months, when you're having to finish this and print that and go there and hand in this and that thing. You are so busy and wrapped up in finishing. And so one of the things that make people not finish um, is because the work of finishing is extra. It's a reality. The work of finishing is an extra job. It's like you have another KPI on your list. Yeah. So there's finishing the PhD as in sitting down and typing out the last sentence. Is that. Yeah. But then there's the work of finishing. Yeah. The admin, the emotional work of letting go of it, um, the the getting used to the less meetings with your supervisor, the whole thing. There is the work of finishing. Yeah. And the work of finishing is what will be the number one, the first thing on the list that will end you up with this transition. So. Um, and when you are doing the work of finishing and you are realizing yourself that you are changing, if if you are miss, you are. Now, title is becoming doctor. If you are Mr. Your title, you, you are changing identity. Yeah. So there is that work of becoming a new person. Yeah. And that work of becoming a new person, you can either resist it or or make too much of it. So so embrace it too much. And that also adds in another complexity that we didn't speak yeah. about. Um, but what I'm saying to you, what I'm talking to you about necessarily is also that when you finish your PhD, there's an element of, 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 of finishing that you cannot do without. Otherwise, you won't finish. Mm. And, and when you have done this work of finishing and it's kept you on adrenaline for months, yeah. then you don't have the work anymore because you're done. You've walked on the, sta- on the stage, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And so this thing keeps in. Mm-hmm. So, yes, Annie, Annie and, and uh, take this two and there'll be last one. Ani and um
okay, maybe bigger things, I can go for an hour again. So that I'm not totally disconnected to my total world. Because I feel like the injustice to think that your pain is your entire life. By the time I get it, it's like, yeah, I got it, but my whole life is also part of the journey. And like you say, that towards like now, I know like a lot of time I can't go to a lot of events. But this it's almost like I conscientize my community to say, you understand why I can't be at this event. Mm. You know, but there's things that you can't miss, like your nephews, they're not gonna understand that. Go for an hour, see them, if they come home and, and fully engage with your community. So I really don't think if if you if you totally disconnect, I could understand the extremity of the postdoc syndrome. So I was going to talk about the layers of it. Mm. And that there's extremity. So if you're gonna lay things and not have a purpose about it, then you are putting yourself up to that. But then the point that the two points I wanted to raise was then how does postdoc help us? Because a part of me starts to feel like universities promote us to go into postdoc, etc. For me, it seems like they just don't want you to re-enter your life. I feel you're now going back into, does it really help? Is it actually a solution to postdoc syndrome? Or is it just perpetuating postdoc syndrome to go back into a post, sort of a postdoc uh, situation? And at the same time, the other flip side is that sort of, how the culture around the PhD has been created. Like, with your PhD, the world is your oyster. You will now travel the world. People will be calling you for conferences. And then, don't alone, no jobs, nothing. You know? So I feel it's also institutionally perpetuated, the postdoc syndrome. That you might actually have done most of the things and be aware to say, okay, I know why I'm doing this, even if I don't publish 10 articles, but you know, I understand the journey that I'm taking. But if we're gonna at the same time be so that now that you have a like you said a one percenter, now you have a one percenter, this is how your world is going to look like. And then all of a sudden it doesn't look like that. You know, yeah. so so I think it, it, it postdoc syndrome it works both ways. It's not just the, the doctorate element, yeah. but also how the institutional bodies have now have actually created this world that perpetuates such a the, the syndrome. Sure. Yep. Um, Last I think one. I agree with all sort of the thoughts that came up in both sides of you don't have to disconnect from family and stuff. But then I also really, really am swayed to agree with 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 um, what Neva was saying that you can try your best to stay connected to your family and in your mind not change at all. But you have no idea how external forces influence the subconscious of your family. Symbolically, that breakdown changes their mindset of who you are. So their behavior towards you afterwards is going to change. You think that I've never changed, but the way they treat you might change. Symbolically, my sister would joke. I mean, my sister would jokefully sometimes say like to my mom, like, no, you really need to plaster the walls, fix the roof. You're going to have a PhD stand stay here. You can come home and sleep <laughs> with the leaking roof and stuff. Yeah. Their behavior towards you also changes because what the media puts out there, just this goes around having a PhD. People that don't understand what a PhD means, but they know Mandela was also Dr. What, what, or what. And what that means, the caliber of those people. So they change towards you, and you're forced to like, no, I didn't change. Why are people changing? And it's also external. Yeah. So it, it's it's unavoidable. It's going to be <laughs> yeah. PhD yeah. post tra trauma life. So so, so so thank you for that. Um, it is unavoidable because yes, the also because you are weird. Remember, I started there. You are weird. You cannot ex you cannot run away from the fact that you are weird. You are. Right? So <laughs> as I see you, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> so because you are weird, the now that it, it has a stamp on it and people there was a ceremony about it. <laughs> you know, where your weirdness. <laughs> yeah. In this graduation cer uh, uh, um, like I showed you on my video, um I was the only one PhD graduate in that city. Yeah. That's serious. Oh my goodness. Like, what a thing am I? Like, wow, you know? I get five minutes and everybody else gets five seconds. Um, and, and, and so, you, you are weird. Yeah. And because you are weird, the world does not know what to do with you. Um, you used to be, um, you know, John, and now you are Dr. John, and it, it is amplified, you know? And you're like, but I'm the same person. I know you're Dr. John, you know, and even when they ask you to do things at home, um, it can be like, no, let's ask Dr. John, no. you know, and it's like, you become a keynote speaker you know? in a, in a five-year birthday suddenly, party. You know? So, 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 
<laughs> That's true. <laughs> right? So there's this, there's this thing, and, and all you want to do yeah, is be yourself. Experience. But the thing is, you yes. have changed, right? Yeah. Let me finish like this. One of my friends, it was almost a year ago, if not just over a year ago, um, on a Saturday afternoon, um, th around 3 o'clock, I had just come back from the shops. Um, my phone is connected to my car, um, and as I pull into the um, carport, my phone rings. And when I answer the phone, she bursts out in tears. Um, this is the day after she had told me about the beautiful night she had had with her husband, and she was so happy about how they have sat in the bath after such a long time together for three hours and it was awesome and what 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 and she burst out in tears because that morning he had said i'm packing my bags i'm leaving and she was like we're going to where and he's like i'm saying i'm leaving like i'm packing my bags i'm, I'm leaving and she couldn't see it coming this is the same person who through her a PhD party at a five-star venue. He paid for everything. He supported her. He made her coffee every single um, midnight oil that she was Men are trash. <laughs> he made her breakfast every day when she had a deadline. Um, and he took the children to school for those four years every single day. So it was normal. They normalized her. It was very normal. Mm. And that Saturday afternoon, she had to deal with her husband who packed her bags and left. Oh. And so oh. we've had to have this conversation. Subconscious. Um, me and her about, friend, you've changed. And you're not the person that he fell in love with when he married 15 years ago. Um, it was the week before their 15-year anniversary. Um, and they were actually planning to go away and what, 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 what. So this is a reality. I'm sharing the story with you as one of the stories that I know of. I, I know many of them. Um, I also know many stories of people who've been holding on to PhDs for 10 years yeah. because they're very afraid of what happens afterwards. Mm. Um, and I, I thought to bring this to you um, just so that you can be in, in, in anticipation um, and begin to think in your own life, how does this apply? And how can you re-enter... Um, because you cannot avoid that you are you are disconnected because you you are becoming more and more weird. Um, the closer you you get to that red dot. Thank you.